Thanks for checking out my video. I'll be showing you how to make this loopy drop shoulder jacket. I designed this sweater to be very beginner friendly. It's got a loose fit, so it leaves a lot of leeway with sizing. It's made entirely from easy to make rectangular panels with the option for a little bit of shaping at the end of the project at the cuff and the waist. And I'll be using this jumbo weight yarn, which works up really quickly for a garment. Its fluffiness makes it extra forgiving, so if you skip a stitch or stitch in the wrong spot, it's not very noticeable. Also, it uses just two stitches, a loop stitch and a US double crochet. Using the loop stitch makes it easy to count stitches, which can be confusing when you're first starting out. I'll be making this tutorial using a solid gray yarn, but I'll show you where to change colors if you want to make a striped one. I'll be making my sweater to fit a woman's size small, like a US size 2-4, but I'll be showing you how to make it in any size you'd like. This sweater uses a size 7 jumbo weight chenille yarn. I'll put information and links for it in the description below. Aside from the yarn, you'll also need a pair of scissors, some safety pins, a tape measure, a tapestry needle, and an 11.5 millimeter crochet hook, which is a size P hook. You'll begin by taking three measurements. With your arm stretched out in the back, you'll measure from just below your bicep where a loose t-shirt would end to the other side, and then a second measurement from there to a few inches above your wrist. Then on the front side, you measure from the top point of your shoulder down along the fullest part of your bust to about an inch above your waist. Once you have these three measurements, I'll mark them here as A, B, and C. You can start making the panels. The sweater has five panels, a back, two front pieces, and two sleeves. Each sleeve panel will be folded in half. And I'll show you how to do a little shaping once the sweater has been assembled. Starting with the back panel, make a rectangle that is your A measurement wide by your B measurement tall. In my case, mine will be 28 inches wide by 16 inches tall. Next, your front panels will each be half the width of your measurement A, and the height will be your measurement B. So here, mine will each be 14 by 16. And each sleeve will be C by B doubled minus seven inches. So my panels will end up being 11 by 25 inches. And you can see where I've done the math in the lighter blue. And the seven inches comes from starting the arm three and a half inches above the waist. This diagram on the left shows the sweater laying flat before it's folded over and sewn up. And you can see the three and a half inches on both sides, which makes seven. With any of the rectangular panels you'll be making, you'll always have a starting tail in your lower right-hand corner. And after you finish your work, you'll end up with your yarn in the upper left-hand corner. And I'll call that your ending tail. I'll get more in depth about tails at the end of the project, but for now I'd recommend, if you're using the same type of yarn as me, in general, that you should make your tails a little bit longer than normal, about six inches or so. Because this particular project sheds at the ends, you'll have to treat it a little bit differently than you would other types of yarn. So if you'd like to save on time and clean up at the end of your project by using your tails instead of extra pieces of yarn to sew up your sweater, you can use this drawing as a guide. I'll leave it up on the screen for a moment in case you want to take a screenshot or make a note of it. Anywhere on this drawing where it doesn't specify how long your tail should be, just make it your standard six inches or so, as I mentioned earlier. To begin, you'll start with the back panel and start by making a slip knot. Where you fold the yarn will determine the length of your starting tail. I didn't make it the same length as the drawing in my recommendation, just for demonstration purposes, so you could easily see the loose end of my knot in the frame of my video. Now insert your hook into the loop and pull to tighten. Now you'll begin to make a chain. Take the long working end of your yarn and wrap it around to the front of your hook and pull it through the loop that's on your hook. You've just done one chain. Repeat this step again and again, wrapping your yarn from the back over to the front of the hook and pulling through the loop that's on your hook. This series of chains is called your foundation chain and you'll use it to begin pretty much any crochet project. Try to keep a somewhat loose and even tension throughout your foundation chain. Keep chaining until you have an even number of chains that's as close as you can get to your measurement A. In my case, that's 28 inches. 
Especially when you're first starting out, it can be confusing when you're trying to count chains and stitches. I've made this enlarged chain here to make it easier to see what I'm talking about. You have the working yarn that's on your hook coming out of the last chain you just completed. You can identify each chain by this V-shape here. That's the first chain from your hook. The second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. That here is your slip knot. You don't count that. The reason for wanting an even number of chains is because you'll make your back panel the same number of chains as your front, which has two pieces. So you'll need an even number of chains to divide it in half. Once you confirmed you have an even number of chains, make one final chain. And the reason why you make that extra chain is because you need it as a turning chain to bring your work up to the next row. Once you've finished your foundation chain, you'll begin making your first row of loop stitches. You'll insert your hook not into the first chain we just talked about, but into the second chain from the hook, right here. You now have two loops on your hook. Next, you'll grab your working yarn and pull up a loop similar to how you would start to tie a bow on your shoes, pulling about two inches up with your pointer finger. Take the yarn that's pressed against the back of your hook and bring it around to catch on the front part of your hook. Then pull it through the first loop on your hook. Take your finger out of the big loop you just made and see that you have two loops on your hook. You can use your pointer finger on the hand that's holding the hook to keep everything secured. And you can use the other hand to grab the loose working yarn to get a better grip on your yarn. Bring the working yarn over to the front of the hook and pull through both loops. You now have one loop left on the hook. You've made your first loop stitch. Insert your hook into the second chain from the hook, the one that doesn't have all the yarn you just worked coming out of it. Then make a big loop and catch it from the back to the front. Pull through one loop on your hook, and then with a good grip on your work, yarn over and pull through the two loops on your hook. Insert your hook into the next unoccupied stitch, grab a loop, twist and pull through, Yarn over and pull through two loops. I'll repeat this a few more times so you can get the feel of it. By now you can see that your loop stitch row is starting to take shape. Continue making loop stitches until you near the end of your chain, and then I'll come back and show you what to do next. With one chain left in your row, you'll make your final loop stitch as usual. If you count the number of big loops you have now, it should be the same as the even number you had when making your foundation row. For the next row, you'll be making double crochet stitches, which are taller than the loop stitches, so for your turning chain, instead of chaining one, you'll chain two to get that extra height. If you're familiar with double crochet, you may be used to chaining three for your turning chain, which is fine, but the reason why I suggest chaining two for this project is because the yarn is so bulky, two makes a cleaner edge. After making your turning chains, turn your work. Take a look at the top of your work and locate the third chain, or V, from the hook. It will line up directly with the first loop stitch, which is an easy way to find it. To make the double crochet stitch, yarn over the hook and insert it into that third chain from the hook, going in through the middle and out through the back of the loop. You'll now have three loops on your hook. Yarn over and pull through the first loop. There should be three loops left on your hook. Then yarn over and pull through the first two 
and then yarn over and pull through the last two. And then you'll have one loop left on your hook. Repeat the process for your next double crochet stitch. Yarn over, insert your hook into the next available free chain. Yarn over and pull through the loop. Then yarn over and pull through two. And then yarn over and pull through two. Again, yarn over, insert your hook, come out the back, then yarn over and pull through one. Yarn over, pull through two, and yarn over, pull through two. I'll show you this process a few more times so you can get comfortable with it. Feel free to slow down or rewind this video. Continue making double crochets until you near the end of your row, and then I'll come back and show you what to do next. Okay, I'm back and there's just one more stitch in this row left to do. And continue like you normally would, where you yarn over, insert the hook, pull up a loop, yarn over and pull through two, yarn over, and on the pull through two, if you're making a solid color sweater, you'd pull through. But if you're making a striped sweater, or if you're running out of yarn, this is where you'd switch to new yarn. You leave yourself a tail, and then you latch your new yarn onto the hook and pull through your last two loops. The next row will be a loop stitch, so for your turning chain, you chain one and then turn your work. And then repeat as usual for a loop stitch. Insert your hook into the second chain from the hook, and continue doing a loop stitch for the rest of the row. I showed you here in a contrasting yellow color to make it easier to see and to show you how to do stripes, but I'm going to go back and redo my work to make a solid gray sweater. When you're at the end of your row, you want to count your stitches, and you can do this by counting loops which makes it really easy to make sure you have the same number of loop stitches on your bottom row as you do on your top. And you should do this periodically throughout the project to make sure your work is consistent. When you get to the end of your loop stitch row, you chain two and turn your work, and then start your next row of double crochet into your third chain from the hook. And just a reminder, you can use that loop as a quick guide to find the stitch that you need to go into. This project is just a two row repeat, so you'll continue alternating rows of loop stitches and rows of double crochet until you work up to the height of the measurement you need for your panel. And this process will be the same for all five panels you have to make. Once you're at the end of your panel, you'll have to secure it by binding off. So you chain one, or you can chain two if you wanna make it extra secure. Grab your scissors and cut to the length of your ending tail that you need and pull through, taking it off the hook and just pull a little bit to tighten it. When making your front panels, take the number of loops you have from a row in your back panel. It should be an even number, in my case it was 38. Divide it in half, which would be 19. And then you'll always have to chain one extra on your foundation row for turning. So for my front panel, I'll be making 20 chains on my foundation row, and I'll end up with 19 loops on each row. Once you have all five panels, lay them out like a sweater and make sure everything's looking good. Setting it up this way will ensure you have all your panels going in the right direction with the loops hanging down in the direction of your waist and wrists. Then open them up like this and have them lay flat. Keep in mind you'll be joining your panels from the inside of the sweater, so you'll want to do your work with the non-loopy side or wrong side facing up. If you're using those extra long tails I mentioned earlier in the video, lay them out like this. 
This is an overview of the joining process. And then I'll take you through each seam step by step. First, you'll join the front pieces to the back piece along the shoulder seam and then one edge of each sleeve. Then fold the sweater over in half so the front touches the back. You'll stitch up the underarms followed by the sides. At this point, you'll be able to do any shaping that you'd like to to the cuffs and waist. When joining the shoulder seam, you'll need to leave room for the collar. Starting where the two front panels meet, count in five stitches or loops, and then stick a pin in the one next to it, the sixth one. When you go to connect your panels, you'll be leaving those five stitches free. Be sure not to confuse your slip knot right there with a the stitch. So you'll have one, two, three, four, five, and stick a pin in the sixth stitch. Starting with where your pin is, count over to the edge of your work. In my example here, I'll have 14 stitches left. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So now you'll want to flip your back panel so you can count the stitches. And you'll count from the outside edge in to the same number as what you counted on your front panel. In my case, it's 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You can count again to double check your work before you sew it up. And again, don't confuse the end where the slip knot is with the stitch. When you're sure that everything's aligned, take the safety pin that's in the front panel and keeping it in that chain, you can join it to the back panel. Then line up the edges of your front and back panel and stick a pin in those first stitches. You'll repeat this exact process for the other front panel where you count in five stitches, put a pin in the sixth stitch, and starting with the stitch that has the pin in it, you'll count the remaining number of loops, which should mirror what you had on the other panel. For me, that's 14. Then on your back panel, counting in from the outside edge to the same number of loops. So here it'll be 14. Double checking that you've got your count correct before you stitch up. Then join that spot with the pin on your front panel. Then pin the edges of your work together. You can go back and add more safety pins in between your two pins on each front panel to stabilize the work and keep it aligned. With your front and back panels pinned together, you can drape it over your shoulders to see how it fits at the neckline. If you need to adjust the neckline, just move the two safety pins that are on opposite sides of your neck, taking care that how many of your stitches you move it on one side, you move it the same number of stitches on the other side. I'll be showing you the slip stitch method for joining your panels, but you can sew them with a tapestry needle or any other method you prefer. The slip stitch method creates a nice sturdy seam, but it also adds bulk. But because the design of the sweater is so bulky to begin with, it doesn't make much of a difference. Lay your work with the front panels facing up and your pieces with the loopy sides touching. In the right hand corner where your pins are, Take your hook and insert it through the front and back loops of each V-shape on each panel. Then yarn over and pull up a loop through both panels. Insert your hook into the next pair of stitches. Yarn over and pull through. You'll have two loops on your hook. With a turning motion, bring the loop that's under the groove in your hook through the other loop. There will be one loop left on your hook. Continue yarning over and pulling up a loop through both panels, slipping one loop through the other until you get to the last safety pin of that front panel. Complete a slip stitch for the last pair that's joined by the safety pin for that panel. Then separate the front and back panel and slip stitch into the back panel only until you get to the next safety pin. This section will create a nice reinforced stitch along the back of your neckline. When you get to the safety pin, start working into the front and back panels again, and slip stitch until the end of the panel. At the end of your row, bind off as usual, cut your yarn leaving room for a tail, and take the rest of the safety pins out of your work. You've just completed the body of your sweater. 
Next, you'll join the sleeves to the body. With the loopy sides touching each other, center the sleeve along the body panel. Use the long tail from the sleeve if you have it or another piece of yarn and join the panels together. You can sew up the sleeves with a tapestry needle or with the slip stitch method. Keep in mind you'll be joining the top edge of your sleeve panel to the side edge of your body panel. Side edges don't have those nice clean V shapes, so the stitches won't be as neat and easy to align as they were along your shoulder seam. But with the fluffiness of the yarn and the loops, it won't be noticeable if you don't make perfectly regular stitches. Once you've joined the long end of your sleeves for both arms, fold your work together like this, still keeping the loopy sides touching one another, and get ready to stitch the underarms of your sleeves together. Put as many safety pins in as you need to keep your work aligned and secure while stitching. And make sure your loops are tucked in so you don't stitch into them. Once the underside of your sleeves have been sewn up, if you have any leftover yarn attached, don't cut it. You can use it to shape your cuffs. At this point, everything should be attached except for the sides near the waistline. You can stitch these together using the excess tails that are on the front and back panels if you have them, or with new pieces of yarn. I designed this sweater to be super beginner friendly with no stitch increases or decreases. But that leaves a really wide sleeve and cuff. So if you'd like to take that area in a little bit, thread the tapestry needle with either the remainder of your tail or a new piece of yarn. Turn your loops inward so you're not sewing into them and sew around your cuff. When you get to the beginning of where you started, Gently pull on the tail to close the opening of your cuff to the size that you'd like. Do the same to your other cuff, then lay them on top of each other to make sure that they match. Before you knot them, flip the sweater right side out, try it on, make sure it feels good and even, and then knot the ends leaving a tail. If you'd like to gather the waistline of your sweater, I'm showing you here on my striped version with a contrasting yarn. Use the tapestry needle in the same way you did your cuff and sew in about every other stitch. Then pull to tighten until it's the width you want and then knot off the ends. At this point, your sweater is complete except for the loose ends that need to be sewn in. As you've probably already noticed, this particular yarn sheds really badly at the ends. Chenille yarn in general has a tendency for the tail to worm its way out after you've sewn it in. I'm going to show you how you can solve both of these problems in one step. If you were working with any other yarn, you'd just be able to take your needle and weave it up and down your stitches to sew in your tail. But because this yarn is inevitably going to work its way out again, this is what you do. Using your tapestry needle, sew the tail in a few stitches and you can even start to reverse direction. Then remove the needle and cut the yarn down until there's only about a two to three inch tail. Pull the fuzz off in small bits until you get near your sweater. You should be left with two tails. Each tail should be made up of two pieces of thread. Insert your unthreaded needle into a nearby stitch like this and thread one tail into the eye of the needle. Pull the needle through, bringing the tail along with it, and tie the two tails together a few times in a knot to secure it. And then cut the end. And your sweater is complete. I'll be posting more videos soon, so if you enjoyed this project, please consider subscribing and stay up to date on new videos as they come out. See you next time!